really great to be back home in good old Anderson, South Carolina, and be hanging out with you fine people today on Easter. Um, 11.15 service, we've had three services so far. We've seen around between 40 and 45 people except Christ so far this weekend. So yeah. And I wanted to go ahead and um, make this announcement. Super cool, super excited about this. Um, we are about 99% done. I always say 99% because there's always that 1% thing. Um, 99% sure that we have located a facility that we're going to be able to start leasing and actually start meeting together in uh, sometime in the summer, June or July. Um, and, and so we've we found it, we've located it. I'm not going to tell you where it is yet um, because we, we, we're still working out the deal, all right? And, but if you'll pay attention on, on social media, which obviously you watch because you're here, um, we're going to be announcing where that's going to be. And hopefully June, July time period, we're going to be able to start meeting together every week. And hopefully, now a lot of people ask, where are your campuses going to be? It's a campus, all right? We, 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 one at a time, and it's going to be in Anderson. And people are like, why Anderson? Because I live here. That, that's why. And so, so that's where we're going to start. Super excited and um, super, super thankful that you came out today. Um, the 1115 service is the service um, I knew that you're here uh, because you're trying to delay being with your family as long as possible. So I understand. I'm, I'm with you. Everybody in this room knows what it's like to experience disappointment. D disappointment in a person, disappointment in an experience, all of us, all of us, this Disappointment does not discriminate. It doesn't care how old you are. It doesn't care how much money you have or how much money you don't have. All of us have experienced disappointment. Now, I have a friend. Well, let me say this. I had a friend. After this illustration, I'm not sure if he's still a friend. But I confronted him on this before I ever gave this illustration. So I, I think he's still a friend. We'll find out later on. Um, named Dave. And it's real safe to talk about Dave because he lives in the UK. So there's no danger of him like bumping into me today walking down the street. And Dave is a good guy. He really is. In fact, he's a, um, he's a man's man. He's, he's scrappy. So in other words, if you were ever going to get in a fight, you would want Dave on your team. Okay? Not that I'm advocating violence. I'm just saying that I, I want Dave on my team. He's Welsh. He's from Wales. You know the grape juice people? Um, so a little bit of a chip on his shoulder, I think, because of that. Um, he, uh, if Dave lived in the southeastern part of the United States, he would drive a Ford F-150, and he would um, have a shotgun, a rifle, and a four-wheel drive because a country boy can survive. That would, be, that would be his theme song, okay? So, in fact, last time I was over in the U.K. hanging out with him, he said, he said the next time you come over, would you like to go boxing? I was like, like with, the, with the gloves and stuff? He goes, yeah, yeah, would you want to do that? I was like, no, <laughs> not at all. And he said, why not? And I said, I'm allergic. He said, you're allergic to boxing? I was like, no, I'm allergic to getting punched in the face, Dave. I, I don't like to get hit. So that's the kind of man that we're talking about. So with all of that in mind, told you all that to set this story up. Dave is walking out of the theater, and I see this on Instagram stories, and his wife, Saz, is kind of talking to him, and they had just gone to see the movie um, The Greatest Showman. Anybody seen that movie? Anybody seen? Okay, I haven't seen the movie, um, so I can't say whether it's good or bad, but Dave was raving. In fact, Saz said, Dave, what did you think about this movie? And Dave said, it's the greatest movie I've ever seen. And I was like, oh, wow, that's, pretty, that's a pretty bold statement. And, and Sass said, Dave, it's the greatest movie you've seen since. And Dave said, Titanic. And that's where he lost his man card. That's where I had to draw the line. That's where I had to say, Dave, I thought you were a man's man, but now I'm questioning everything. I, because Titanic, can you imagine running into a good old boy? Hey, man, what's the best movie you've ever seen? Titanic. Love that movie. When, when Rose murdered that boy, Jack, because there was room on that door. And then she threw millions of dollars in the sea. Love it. Got it. I, got it on, I got it on VHS. Watch it over and over and over. Like, you can't imagine it. So when I saw that, I was like, he could have said Braveheart. He could have said Gladiator. He could have said The Last Samurai. He could have said Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I would have been okay with anything in there. But Titanic. And I was so, I told him that. I told him I was disappointed at him. And he's not going to do anything about it because he's in the UK. And I, I don't foresee him coming over here anytime soon. But 
All of us know what that's like, where we see something, we hear something, we experience something, and our gut reaction is disappointment. Now, just like all of us have been disappointed in other people, just like all of us have probably been disappointed in experiences, I would be willing to bet, with the people that are honest, that the person that you're the most disappointed with on a consistent basis is the person you see in the mirror every day. That's my, that's my experience. I, nobody has lied to me, deceived me, or disappointed me more than me. And I'd be willing to bet that there's some people in the room, if you were honest, that you've disappointed you. All of us in this room have said things that we said we would never say and done things that, that we said we would never do. And as a result, we feel disappointed, maybe a little condemnation in there. And because of that, because of that, it's really easy to transition it if other people are disappointed in me. Because isn't it funny how quick uh, other people are to tell you how disappointed they are in you, especially with social media now. Other people have disappointed, and I'm dis I'm disappointed in me. Therefore, God must be disappointed in me. In fact, we kind of imagine God in heaven looking down on us, kind of like our teacher did in elementary school, walking by our desk, going. And there are people in this room that I really believe with all my heart that the reason you're at this Easter service today, if you don't hear anything else I say, is to hear this. God is not disappointed in you. And his grace will see you through whatever circumstance you find yourself in. God is not disappointed in you. And I'm going to prove it. I'm going to prove it. I'm going to prove it from the Bible. If you have a Bible, go to um, Matthew 26 and John 21. We're going to start in Matthew 26. We're going to finish in John 21. If you didn't bring a Bible, we paid some money to have it on the screen. So that's going to be real cool, okay? That's what I would do. I just watch it on the screen. But Matthew 26, John 21. And let me kind of set this up. We're, we're coming out of this event called the Last Supper. That's what we call it. The disciples didn't know it was the Last Supper. Um, that, 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 how awkward would that be if you got together with your family today and like somebody stood up and said, this is our Last Supper. You'd be like, oh, snap. Um, so, so they didn't know it was the Last Supper. They just thought it was, in fact, it was a celebration meal. It was the Passover. Now, if you grew up in church, right, um, we never saw the Lord's Supper as a celebration. We always saw it as something they tacked at the end of the service. Remember that? And they would, you got those little stale crackers and you got the grape juice. Remember that? Or, and you were Catholic, you got real wine, which I'm not sure is the best illustration for me to use. But, but nonetheless, I, that's why some of you were Catholic. Anyway, so you, you kind of passed that by. And it was always just like this sad thing. Or maybe you saw the painting with Da Vinci. By the way, he wasn't there. But you saw the painting, and there's Judas over in the corner, and he looks a little sketch, and nobody really knows what's going on in the middle. But the Lord's Supper, it, it actually goes all the way back to the book of Exodus. It was a festival that the Jewish people actually still celebrate to this day called Passover. And in it, they're celebrating the fact that they were set free from slavery from Egypt. And it's a celebration. For Americans, it's like the 4th of July. Okay? Nobody on the 4th of July is like, man, let's just be somber. No, we're going to eat something and blow something up, especially here in the southeastern part of the United States, right? So this is a celebration. They're entering the celebration, celebrating the fact they've been set free. And then Jesus completely drops a bomb in the middle of the party by saying this. The Bible says in Matthew 26, Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. How's that to announce at a party? Hey guys, it's been great. We've been hanging out for three years. Love you guys so much. I just want you to know you're about to all turn your back on me. That had, and, but don't miss this, don't miss this. Jesus is telling them, I know you're about to sin. I know what you're getting ready to do. Because he understood something about us that sometimes we don't understand. I know I don't understand this about me, but, but if you kind of step back and think about it, isn't, isn't it convenient sometimes to follow Jesus? And then isn't it not convenient at other times to follow Jesus? It's okay. You can admit it. This is a second chance church. Um, it's okay. Like, 
It's convenient to follow Jesus for me. It's not difficult for me to follow Jesus when we're singing It Is Well With My Soul. I mean, that was awesome, and I've got goosebumps that have goosebumps that produce more goosebumps, and it's just amazing. And I'm like, I'm not struggling to follow Jesus during that moment. I'm not struggling to follow Jesus when I'm engaged in the Scripture and reading my Bible. You know when I have a tough time following Jesus? When I'm stuck in traffic on Clemson Boulevard during Christmas season. That's where it's difficult to follow Jesus. It's difficult to follow Jesus when I'm at Chick-fil-A behind the lady that we've stood in line for seven minutes and they haven't changed their menu in 17 years and she gets to the cash register and she don't know what to order. That's when it's tough to follow Jesus. So it's, sometimes it's convenient to follow Jesus and sometimes it's not so convenient to follow Jesus. And Jesus understands that about the disciples. For, for example, if you were with Jesus, there would have been some times it would have been really convenient to follow Jesus. Like when Jesus healed the leper, like the leper came up to him and was like falling apart, like literally falling apart. Um, it was like, hey man, you left your arm. And, and all of a sudden Jesus touches him and heals him. It's good to be associated with Jesus during that time. Or when Jesus fed 5,000 people with five, well, like a Happy Meal from McDonald's that they, they kind of picked up from a little boy on the way, that's a good time to be associated with Jesus. Or when Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead. I mean, when you're with a guy that can show up to a funeral and turn it into a party, that's a great place to be because I've never pulled that trick off. I, I've never kind of walked up to a funeral and said, hey, hey, get up. Because if the guy got up, I would run. I'd be freaked out, right? So the disciples are following Jesus because it's real convenient for them to follow Jesus. But Jesus is basically telling them, guys, there's, about, there, there's something about to happen. And when it happens, it's not going to be convenient to follow me anymore. And when it's not convenient to follow me anymore, all of you are going to turn your back. Which kind of brings me to this thing, aren't you glad, aren't you glad that the Bible tells the whole story? And aren't you glad that we see in this passage that true, what's true about these men is true about us? Jesus didn't call us to follow him because we're perfect. He called us to follow him because of our potential. And aren't you greater today that your potential is the reason Jesus called you and not your perfection? Because none of us in this room have gotten being perfect right. We've all messed up. The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the problem is, is even when we mess up, when we sin, when we make mistakes, and we get caught up in that time period, we feel like we're a disappointment. But I'm telling you, you, I, listen, this is the message that I've been preaching for years. I'll preach it till the day that I die, that everybody in this room was created on purpose, with a purpose, for a purpose. You're not an accident. Jesus knew exactly what we were going to do before he made us, and he made, it us, he made us anyway, and went ahead and arranged for the payment for our sin to be made before we even sinned. How incredible is that? Here, do you, do you know what a, do you know how miraculous it is that you're even here? Like, like I, found, I found these stats on Google, so they're true. The odds of you being struck by lightning. Anybody freaked out by lightning? Anybody? I love lightning. Like, I will go outside and watch it. So if I ever go out, just know I was being dumb. But I understand that the odds of me being struck by lightning are 1 in 700,000. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be all right. The odds of getting attacked by a shark are 1 in 11.5 million, which is good enough for me. Good enough for me. I don't ever need to go in the ocean. It, I, if somebody... I, I, there's no need for me to ever go in the ocean, ever. Somebody gets attacked by a shark, I'm like, you shouldn't have been in this house, right? Um, that serves you right. The odds of you winning the lottery. Now, I'm just kind of curious. Because this is second chance, church. I'm just kind of, how many people have ever bought a lottery ticket? Come on, come on, come on. Uh, yeah, this week. Oh, yeah, so everybody's like, no, no, not this week. It was back when I smoked crack every week. All right, so, odds <laughs> of you winning the lottery are 1 in 175 million. 
In other words, the odds are greater that you'll get struck by lightning while being eaten by a shark in a tornado than winning the lottery. But hey, if you win, tithing's biblical. The last, the last, but, not, last but not least, out of all those, the odds of you being born, like everything that had to come together for you to actually be here, are one in 400 trillion. In other words, if your mom wouldn't have had that extra glass of wine, you might not be here, all right? You can think about that later. The thing I'm trying to prove is this. You are a freaking miracle. When God made you, he knew exactly what he was doing, and how can you disappoint someone that knew everything about you before he created you to begin with? Now, the story, the story gets better because of this next verse. In fact, this next verse is what really solidified um, me wanting to use this text for this particular message. Jesus said this in verse 32. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Now that verse is loaded. And I'll sh- Jesus is basically saying, I know what you're going to do. I know what you're going to do. Have you, ever, have you ever messed up and you knew you were going to do it before you did it? Like you just knew it. Or have you... Moms and dads, have you ever known your kid is just going to mess up before they even do? Like, I know what they're going to do. I know what they're going to do. Um, why was it last week or two weeks ago? My friend Mark, it all runs together now. My friend Mark sent me um, a thank you card. And it was cool. It's thank you card, you know, thank you for being a friend or whatever. But he also sent me a bag of Butterfinger. Now, I want to pause. Please do not send me any Butterfinger. This is not me subliminally. In fact, if you send me a Butterfinger, I'm going to throw it in the trash. And some of you are like, well, they're starving. Okay, if they're starving kids, send them the Butterfinger, all right? Because I don't want, I, I love Butterfingers. my favorite candy bar in the world. But Mark sent me the Butterfinger, and I knew what I should have done. I should have immediately taken, thrown it in the trash, got it out of my house, whatever. And it was the fun size, fun size, which always trips me out. Because fun size Butterfinger to me would be the size of, like, Delaware. But, but, but this is the fun size. And as soon as I got it, I knew what I should have done. But I was like, I'm going to put this Butterfinger right here in my kitchen. Right here. And every night, I'm going to have one. That's it. Because what one Butterfinger ain't never hurt nobody. I'm just going to have one. And I put the bag there. First night, not making this up, I walk in, get the Butterfinger, get it out. It brought so much joy to my heart. And I was like, you know what? If, it, if there's that much joy from one Butterfinger... Like, what could two do, right? Not making this up. In the next few moments, I'm in my kitchen floor, Butterfinger wrappers all around me going, I cannot believe. I, I was so disappointed in myself. I knew I was going to do it. I did it anyway. That's what we see in this story. Jesus said, Jesus said this. He said, but after I have risen, pause. None of them believed he was going to do that because they didn't believe he was going to die. So when Jesus says, after I've risen, I'm sure Thomas looked at Matthew and rolled his eyes. Peter looked at John and was like, here we go again with that whole death thing. I don't even know why he keeps bringing it up, because he brought it up five times. They didn't, don't, don't miss this, the people closest to Jesus didn't believe the promises of Jesus. So question, have you ever wrestled believing the promises of God? Because I have. I mean, isn't it easy to tell somebody that's going through a storm that Jesus can calm the storm? Oh, that Jesus can calm the storm. But then you get in the middle of the storm, you're like, Wah! like you freak out. Hmm? Am I the only person like that? Isn't it, isn't it easy to tell somebody that Jesus is the healer until you or somebody you know gets cancer? And then it's a tough, tough, situation to actually believe the promises of God oh this is my favorite God works everything out for the good oh yeah (laughs) that's easy to say when things are going good in your life but when everything falls apart that's a hard one to believe is it not I'm not saying it's not true I believe all the promises of God are true I'm just saying sometimes it's hard to believe and even when we doubt then we're like oh God must be disappointed in me because I doubt So Jesus said, after I've risen, don't miss this, don't miss this. He said, I will go ahead of you 
into Galilee. I'm going to pause real quick. Where had Jesus originally called the disciples to follow him? In what vicinity, what area was, were the disciples in when Jesus said, I want you to follow me? Galilee. Galilee was a seven-day walk from Jerusalem. So when Jesus, Jesus said, not only are you not going to believe my promises, but you're going to go back to where you were before you met me. And when you get there, I'll meet you there. That's insane to me. That, that really is. Jesus goes, not only are you going to deny me, you're going to take some steps backwards in your spiritual journey. And when you take these steps backwards, I'm not going to stand right here and go, when you decide to change your ways. He said, no, 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 no. I'll come to you and meet you because you can't outrun my grace. Mind-blowing. And I'm saying that because there's some people in this room that maybe you said you, you, said you would never do that and you did it and you liked it. We're just being honest. And then when that happens, you're like, I'm so disappointed in me. God must be disappointed in me. There's no way he wants anything to do with me. And isn't it ironic you're at an Easter service listening to a message telling you that you cannot possibly outrun the grace of God. He said, he said hey, you know how far you've gone back? You know the steps backwards you took? If you'll look around, I'm right there, and we can change things anytime you want. I'll meet you in Galilee. Now, Peter's pretty emotional. Peter, Peter has that thing where he speaks before he thinks. I don't know if you know anybody like that. But the Bible says in verse 33, Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Which we all know Peter's as full of crap as a constipated elephant, right? <laughs> it's funny if you think about it. Now, get this. Peter said, hey, all these guys, they'll probably deny you. But I'm never, Peter promised Jesus he was never going to deny him. You ever made a promise to God you didn't keep? Because I have. God, I'll never do it. And, and, and listen, when we make the promise, we're emotional. Like, we mean it. It's not that we're bad people. It's like, God, I'm going to make this promise, but I'm really not going to make this promise. It's like, God, I'll never do it again. I'll never go there again. I'll never call that person again. I'll never answer this person's call again. God, whatever. You like, God, I will never do it again. And then it happens. Peter's making this promise to Jesus, and he's super emotional. He's caught up in the moment. I will never deny you. I will never go back to Galilee. I'll never go back to doing the things that I used to do before I met you. And Jesus just called him on it. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. These other guys are going to do it once, but Peter, you're an overachiever. You're going to deny me three times, which I want to pause. This is another message for another time, but I just want to point out that Peter gets a lot of flack for denying Jesus three times, but the Pharisees denied Jesus for three years. Isn't it funny how self-righteous people will always deny the grace of God because they don't think they need it, not understanding if it wasn't for the grace of God, all of us would be screwed. I thought about putting that on a t-shirt, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But, but Peter declared, listen to this, even if I have to die with you. You got any friends like that? I don't, I don't know if I got that many. I'm like, I'll, I'll get in a fight with you. I'll, I'll cry with you. I'll laugh with you. Would you die with me? I, ain't, I don't love you that much. I, uh -uh, nah, probably not. You're on your own if we're going to die, all right? But Peter, he's like, man, I'm in. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples, I think because they didn't want to be outdone by Peter, all the other disciples said the same. But then it happened. Just like Jesus said, Jesus gets arrested. And, and, and by the way, the disciples, it, it, it had just started when they bailed. They didn't say, let's hang in there for a little while and see what happens. As soon as the guards showed up with the swords and the torches and the spears and the clubs, they were like, we out. And they were gone. They left Jesus. That, the Bible says they all ran away. Exactly what he said they would do. And he was arrested. 
He was beaten. He was crucified. He rose from the grave. Now, I'm just saying, if it's me and I rise from the grave and my friends turned on me like that, oh, I want to find them. Don't you want to find them? Don't you want to say a couple words to them? Encourage them a little bit, maybe? I didn't want to. Anyway, but the Bible says this, and I love that John recorded it this way. John chapter 21, verse 1. This is after Jesus had rose from the dead, after they denied him. The Bible says, afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. In other words, these guys had taken a seven-day journey from Jerusalem all the way back to Galilee, the place that they had been before they met Jesus, and Jesus followed them back there, not to get them back, but to bring them back into a relationship with him. Jesus isn't trying to get anybody back. He's trying to bring us back. And I've learned through what I've gone through over the past nearly two years now that you can't outrun the grace of God. I was, in, I was in rehab in Arizona in July. Tucson, Arizona in July. Closest to hell I'll ever be. The day I land, it's 110. It's 110. And this is what people go, it's a dry heat. It's 110. It doesn't matter if it's dry or not. Walk outside and I dehydrate immediately. So we had some interesting, I got, I got some great, great rehab stories. Some of them I can actually tell in church. Um, this one I can tell in church. I ran into a guy, and his name's Nick. I can't use, I'm not, can't use his real name, but his name's Nick. And we started talking, and Nick was, we were kind of talking about what he did, you know, and, and then he looked at me, and he said, so, so he said, what do you do for a living? I was like, well, I, Nick, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pastor. He said, you're a pastor? In rehab? How did that happen? I said, Nick, have you ever met Christians? They'll drive you to drinking. I mean, I literally, literally, that's why I'm here. So anyway, no, 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 no. It's like, so we had a great conversation about that, and he kind of laughed and, you know, kind of shared some stories or whatever. A couple days later, Nick comes up to me, he's crying. And I don't, I don't do well with that. Like if somebody comes up to me and they're crying, I'm like, yep, get that fixed. I'll talk to you later. Like I don't know, I don't know what to do, but I'm in rehab, and he's got like a buddy, and I'm like, hey, man, everything all right? He goes, no, nah, man. He said, I just found out my grandma died. I said, well, this, was this, like, expected? Was she? And he said, no, no, very unexpected. He's like, of course, I can't go to the funeral. I'm here. I said, were you close? He's like, yeah, we were really close. He was really tore up. And he said, would you pray with me? And I was like, well, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I said a prayer with him. And a little while later, he came back, and he goes, hey, man, I was kind of curious. Tomorrow, do you think that we could do a memorial service for my grandmother? I was like, are you, are you bringing her in, Nick? Like, like how's that, how's that going to work out? He's like, no, 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 no. She's not going to be here. It'll just be me and you, and you can say a couple words. I was like, well, Nick, I, um, I, don't, I don't know your grandmother. He's like, that's okay. I'll tell you what to say. I was in rehab. I was like, shoot, I'm in. So I, got, I had nothing else to do. So <laughs> that evening, we went, kind of went out, little spot, and me and Nick and Cactus, and we're kind of standing there, and, and it was really awkward for a couple minutes, and then I said, Nick, do you, do you, where do you think your grandmother is? He went, oh, she's in heaven. I said, oh, she, she was a Christian. He's like, yeah. And he just hit me. I said, Nick, you think you'll see her again? He said, man, I don't know. I said, would you like to know? He said, you can know? I said, you absolutely can. And I shared the gospel with him, and Nick met Jesus in rehab. Now, here's the crazy thing. Nick went to rehab thinking his life had fallen apart, and it's at his lowest point in life where he encountered the grace of God. See, the grace of God doesn't hit us when we clean up. The grace of God hits us when we realize we're messed up and we need him to clean us up 
and we turn our life over to him and watch him bring the transformation that we could not bring about in our own life through behavior modification. So Jesus, Jesus shows up and he's on the Sea of Galilee. And, and watch this, watch this. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also called Didymus, which was unfortunate, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. Pause. What did Simon Peter do? What was his occupation before he met Jesus? He was a fisherman. Don't miss this. He's at the place where he was before he met Jesus, doing the things that he was doing before he met Jesus. There's people in this room, that's your story. It's my story. You go back to the place that you were before you met Jesus, doing some of the things that you did before you met Jesus, and there is so much disappointment and hurt and condemnation. I'm not talking about from others, I'm just talking about from your own life. And so, so this, is, this is going on. And the Bible says, so they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And they're professional fishermen. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. And a lot of people have asked why. It's very simple. They weren't looking for him. Because when you get in a place where you were before you met Jesus, doing things that you were doing before you met Jesus, the last person you expect to see is Jesus. But he shows up on the shore. And he says this in verse 5. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? Don't you love that? Because, because if I'm Jesus and these guys had just turned their back on me after promising to have my back, there's a lot of words I can think of in my mind to describe them. Friends is not one. I remember one time I had some guys and I was about to get in a fight and they were like, we got your back, we got your back, we got your back. And I got in the middle of it and I turned around and they did have my back. They were way back. They were way back. And so when I was done here, I had some words for them and I called them a lot of, fr- I like, I called them a lot of things, but friends was not one of them. So Jesus is looking at the guys that denied him and he called them friends. Don't miss this. In other words, here's the message. Guys, I haven't changed my mind about you. I haven't changed my I, I told you you're going to do this. I told you you're going to go back here. I told you you're going to do I, I, I knew this. But I didn't call you because you're perfect. I called you because there's potential. And you know what? Jesus could have yelled at them, stop fishing. How does it feel to fish and not catch anything all night? But that feels good, don't it? Jesus didn't throw it in their face. He just said, friends, catch anything? And I love it. They talked back to him. No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some, which blows my mind. They're professional fishermen. I mean, they didn't think of that all night long. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. I love this. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped in the water. I love this. Peter said, you know what? If that's Jesus and he's here and he's calling me friends and he hadn't changed his mind about me, I don't have time to sit in this boat. I want to get as close to him as possible. And Peter jumped in the water, couldn't even wait to row the boat in. Jumped in the water because he's like, If he hasn't changed his mind about me, I want to live the rest of my life for him. Yeah, I don't have time. Peter Peter didn't have time to think about the denial. He had to focus on the future. And isn't it funny that the man that is known for denying Jesus three times, a few weeks later when it was time to present the gospel for the first time in a public setting, who did Jesus tag to do it? Peter. You know why? Because Jesus didn't call Peter because he was perfect. Jesus called Peter because he was potential. Jesus didn't call Peter because he was cleaned up. Jesus called Peter because Peter knew he was messed up and couldn't clean himself up without the grace of God. Peter said, I don't have time. I don't have time. 
I don't have time to maintain my regrets. And some of us in this room, if you're going to grab a hold of your future, you're going to have to let go of your past. If you're going to grab a hold of your future, we've got to let go of our past. And so I was, I was thinking about how to end this message because, because it's so powerful and it hit me. There's, there's a song that I've been listening to just about every day since I got out of rehab like a year and a half ago. And you, I wouldn't listen to it in rehab, but they take your iPod away and they take everything away, so I couldn't listen to it. It was a song called He Loves Me. It's one of my favorite songs. And the reason is because when you get to the chorus, it talks about sinking into the grace of God, but there's a line, there's just one line that says, I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way he loves me. I don't have time. People go, this is what you did. Yeah, but what I did is not who I am. Right? And if it's true about me, it's true. I don't know, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I want you to listen to me. You don't have time to maintain these regrets because there's still air in your lungs. God still has a plan for your life, and it's still greater than anything you can imagine. So I want everybody to stand to their feet. We're going to sing this song, and we're going to sing it like we mean it, and I'll come back out and do the invitation. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I ask as we sing this song to celebrate your greatness Father, that you would remind every single person in this room, God, that you knew everything we would do before you made us, and you made us anyway. And if we're not dead, then you're not done, and it's not too late. So as we sing it, may we sing it like we mean it so we can live it. We ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Here's the reality. I don't, I don't know where you are in life, but if you feel like, man, I'm a major disappointment to God, I'm a major disappointment to others, I get that. I get that. But you're not a disappointment to Jesus. And today, my hope and prayer is that some in here will give their lives to Christ or come back to Christ because he is not, some people I've heard that Jesus is exactly where you left him. No, he's not. He's came with you the whole way. And all he's waiting on is for you to be like Peter and say, you know what? Out of this boat, into your hands, let's do this. So with that in mind, can we pray? Father, right now, thank you for the reminder of your grace. And Father, I pray for the person, or the, the, just the person here today that feels a weight of guilt and condemnation, Jesus, that they would just be reminded there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And Father, for the person here today that never has given their life to you, maybe because of fear, maybe because they think they'll be judged, maybe because they feel like they can't. Jesus, I pray that you would just remind us all today, we can't, but you can. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, but maybe because you don't think you're good enough or you're struggling, or I'm not sure I can be a Christian, you can abs listen, if the disciples can follow Jesus, any of us can follow Jesus. And if you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, I want you to listen to me. He died on a cross and rose from the grave 2,000 years ago to pay for our sins. And it's not about how good we are. It's about how good that gift is. And it's simply saying, yes, Jesus, if that's what you did, I want to receive you into my life. So if you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ and you want to give your life to Jesus, I want to invite you to pray right where you are, right where you're standing, just right in your heart. And you can just pray in your heart and you say, Jesus Christ, I confess you are Lord. Right now, I ask you to come into my life and take over. I surrender everything to you. I'm yours. Show me how to live for you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Now, with heads still bowed and eyes still closed, if you just pray to receive Christ, if you just 
prayed that prayer to receive Christ, I'm going to count to three. And when I hit three, I want you to put your hand straight in the air. And I want you to leave it there because I want to just see and celebrate with you. One, two, three. If you prayed to receive Christ, I want you to leave him in the air. Leave him there. Leave him there. Leave him in the air. Leave him in the air. That's awesome. That's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. You can put your hands down. You can put your hands down. I want you to listen. If you just prayed to receive Christ, or if you are a Christian, but you really struggle with feeling like you're a disappointment to Jesus, I, I get it. We've got people here that are ready to pray with you or pray for you. If you've raised your hand that you received Christ, we want to fo- we want to get some information from you today. It'll take 30 seconds just to follow up with you, help you take your next steps in your walk with God. Or if you're here today and you're like, man, I need to talk to somebody about this message. I need to talk to somebody about what I'm going through. We have a care team here. They're to my left, to your right, in the back. And if you raised your hand and prayed to receive Christ or you feel like you need someone to pray with you or for you, I want you to walk back there and I want you to go right now. I want you to go right now. Now, if you prayed to receive Christ, if you raised your hand, come on, a lot of people raise your hand, you're not moving, I want you to go. I want you to go right now. You just go right now. Or if you need someone to pray with you or for you, I want you to go right now because that's why they're here. Father, thank you that people are moving. I pray that you would continue to encourage our hearts. Thank you for the lives that have been changed. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Hey, could you be seated for just a second? Just a second. I want to share something really exciting with you. And by the way, on your way out today, if you didn't feel comfortable moving during that time, but you want to swing by our care team uh, tent, they would love to just kind of meet with you. That's not, not a tent. It's really kind of pipe and drape. Sorry I messed that up. Um, somebody was going to email me and tell me I want a tent, so I just want to go ahead and say that real quick. Um, I got super exciting news. Um, one of the things, we are, we're going to be a true church Plant. We are starting over. We're forming a team. We're getting some. Um, we're getting some people. They're like, yes, I want to be involved. And two of those people are two of my really, really good friends. And when I say they they want to get involved, they're moving here from the UK, um, from Great Britain, right? They're moving to America to help start this church with us. And it's Josh and Rose Snowzel. I want you guys to join me on stage for just a second. This is Josh and Rose Snowzel. Snowzell. They are moving over here with two boys and a little girl who is the Queen of England. And if you don't believe it, you can ask her. Rose is with child. Um, yes, and it's okay to say that. And so if it's a boy, we're going to name him Bubba. And if it's a girl, we're going to call her Bobby Sue. And so they're super excited about these southern names that we're going to give this child, it's probably twins, we're not sure yet, um, but yeah, that's what we're praying for, triplets, either either one, but Josh and Rose, listen, this is how cool this is, they, they were like, hey, we're coming, we're coming to help start this church, they put their house up for sale, it sold in five days for the asking price, and so they are, they are coming to America, and we're super excited, I'm super excited about having them come alongside and help, this, help start this thing. And so I'm going to turn the microphone over to, to Rose for just a second. She's asked me not to give it to Josh. And so I'm going to give it to Rose. And she's got the coolest accent in the world. It's British. And so you can, uh, and Rose, will you and Josh close us out? Absolutely. Thank you, Perry. It's such a privilege to be here. It's so great to finally be in Anderson. This has been like kind of a journey for us to get prepared to come and join you guys. And every step of the journey, when God calls you somewhere, it's not necessarily simple. It's not necessarily easy. There are a hundred reasons why you don't sell up your home and move your family to the other side of the world. But there's always one really good reason to do it. And it said, Jesus said, do it. So we're doing it. We're here. We're in Anderson. Um, We can't wait to get to know you all more. We can't wait to start and really begin what it is that God wants to do through Second Chance Church. And we see so much potential in what God is about to do here. So thank you so much for having us. We're excited to be here. I'm going to hand this over to Josh. He's going to pray, and then we're going to close out. Yeah, it's so good to be here. So I'm going to ask every eye to be closed. I'm just going to pray to finish. Father, I thank you for this Easter Sunday. Lord, will we get to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross, that you sent your son, so that we could know forgiveness and we could know eternal life. We get to live in that victory today. I pray a blessing on every person 
that, Father, we wouldn't be defined, Lord, by the, the way that we've been disappointed by ourselves or the things that we've done, but we'd look to you, Father, for that new, fresh start that you give us today. So, Father God, we give you all the thanks and all the glory in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Happy Easter. Enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers.